So, uh, first of all, Happy New Year, everyone. Uh, this is the first of our uh, series of, of, uh, of talks we have for KBM. We've got some uh, great speakers. Uh, and leading uh, off from the front, we have uh, Dr. David Wright, who has many years' uh, experience as an educator in cardiovascular disease. And as a number of you will, have, will uh, be aware, uh, we launched the um, cardiovascular inflammation test, the CIT test, in November of last year. And so um, it's been gradually getting out there. We're getting some really good uh, feedback from everyone. Uh, and so what we thought we'd do is um, build on the initial uh, launch by having uh, Dr. David come on and uh, talk about all the individual markers and then also make that come to life a bit more by also introducing some case studies from his many years experience as well. So without further ado, um, I'll pass you over to Dr. David uh, and he can walk you through uh, a, a quite excellent talk. Uh, and then we'll have a Q&A session at the end um, where you can uh, feel free to ask him uh, any questions that you may have. So without further ado, over to you, Dr. David. Thank you so much, James, and welcome everybody to uh, this webinar. It really is an exciting uh, time because we now can do in-home testing, give people better information, and therefore get better action <clears throat> steps um, un underway. What we're going to talk about is the critical nature of early detection. All of these conditions that you see on the screen are often called diseases of aging, but they truly are diseases and they do take decades to develop. Traditional approach in the medical world is to wait until something is bad enough to call it a disease and then intervene. And that's ridiculous. We, we have to start earlier. We have to get on the front side of all of these conditions. We can't just trust risk factors either. There are lots of tools to try to predict risk for individual patients. But in my experience and the experience of others, unless you test, you're guessing. So let's not guess. Let's let's test folks and, and find out exactly where they are. So we do have several great biochemical markers that can do this for us and really get us in front of the curve so that we can prevent those conditions. The truth is most people don't get the right tests, even if they're seeing a provider, they're not getting the right tests until they've already gotten an advanced stage of their disease. So let's dive into the different tests that are on the inflammatory panel that, that you have access to. We don't want to ignore some of the standard tests. So the standard lipid profile is still a starting point for us. It does give us some idea about a patient's long-term risk for atherosclerosis, heart attack, and stroke. It's not a complete test, but it, it does have value. All of you are familiar with the total cholesterol value, and that looks at a lot of different sub-varieties of that. Uh, you're probably accustomed to thinking of LDL as being the lousy cholesterol, and, and you want it to be lower, and the lower the better. Most cholesterol is carried as LDL, but there are other particles, as you can see, that also carry it. Importantly, triglycerides, we now know, are a direct cause of inflammation and therefore of arterial plaque formation. It's not just a surrogate marker, it's a direct cause of inflammation. It's measured as either a direct value or as VLDL, um, but both of those are important as well in our determination. HDL cholesterol, you may think of it as the higher the better. I, tell, I used to tell patients that's the heavenly cholesterol. Uh, we now know that not all good cholesterol, not all HDL cholesterol is functioning normally, and we'll talk a little bit about that today. But it's important to know what these values are, in part because patients are used to seeing them, and they do still carry value in our analysis. But here's why we need more, because half of all heart attack patients on the day of their heart attack have a normal standard lipid profile. Sometimes that's because they're on treatment already but oftentimes it's because they have what has been called hidden risk. They've got factors even embedded within the cholesterol itself that aren't showing up on the standard test. So we have to do better. But so one of those things we can do better with is looking at the standard lipid profile in a, in a deeper dive. 
And we're going to talk about some of those specifically, but let me give you an overview to what we're going to talk about beyond the standard lipid profile. Deeper dives into lipids, deeper dives into different metabolic tests, and then an inflammatory uh, test that has great utility in the prevention world. This deeper dive into cholesterol uh, starts with just simply dividing the total cholesterol by HDL. We know that that is a great indicator of what a person's plaque is most likely to be doing. And this chart shows you different cut points that have been validated in the literature for predicting the risk of progression of plaque, meaning they're growing it faster and thicker, or we've actually stopped the likelihood of, of progression and even induced some regression uh, in their arterial plaque. So this is a cut point that may or may not be reported on tests that you've traditionally seen, but are reported on the CIT panel. And we want you to use those to help that conversation with patients on, are, are they still progressing? Are they likely to still be having a new plaque formation? Or have we finally achieved optimal regression of that plaque? We know that plaque goes through a life cycle. There, there's a phase of growth where oxidative stress triggers the trapping of cholesterol within the arterial wall. Once that trapped cholesterol is there, it gets oxidized, it triggers an inflammatory response. And then the inflammatory response adds to the oxidative stress. And, and now the fire has started. So we're off to the races uh, with plaque formation. Well, part of that is let's reduce the amount of cholesterol that even gets trapped in the first place. So that's the principle behind this total cholesterol HDL ratio. Another ratio that's important to look at is the triglyceride to HDL ratio. This is important because 70% of folks that are making plaque in their arteries have insulin resistance. And we know that 90% of people that have insulin resistant haven't even been diagnosed because their fasting blood sugar is normal, their A1C is normal, and yet they still have insulin resistance. This ratio predicts risk sooner than the fasting glucose or the hemoglobin A1C. And I apologize, the title of this slide has, has what's more traditional is the tradition triglyceride HDL ratio, uh, the lab that we're, that uh, KBMO is using reports it as an HDL triglyceride ratio. It's the same principle. So when we look at that ratio, if you're Caucasian and that ratio is below 0.29, you're likely to have insulin resistance. And you can see there are different ethnic cut points to use as well. Now you'll notice Asians are not on there. Um, Indian continent patients are not on there, so we don't have cut points for everybody. Um, so the default that I would use if it's not Mexican-American or not Hispanic Black is the 0.29 cut point. Why is insulin resistance such a big deal? Well, when people are insulin resistant, they are having to overproduce insulin in order to control the glucose in the bloodstream. In order to get that glucose into the cells, they're having to overproduce insulin. The high insulin levels are invisible on standard testing, but it's the insulin that acts as a fat fertilizer. It causes deposition of fat around the organs, the visceral fat. That fat in turn is inflammatory. High insulin levels also trigger inflammation inherently triggers inflammation. And finally, insulin is a plaque fertilizer. It makes plaque grow faster and thicker. Well, all of that's invisible while the blood sugar is normal and the A1C is normal and yet their insulin levels are high. The triglyceride and HDL components, however, do start to change. And you can use this ratio to help detect those folks. ApoB is really the best cholesterol test. If you're going to pick one test to predict risk and to monitor patients, it's going to be your ApoB. 
Why do I say that? Well, I tell my own patients that cholesterol doesn't dissolve in water. It's an oily substance. Oil and water don't mix. So it has to be carried in a suitcase through the bloodstream. And that suitcase is this ApoB that's wrapped around the cholesterol. Every suitcase of ApoB is carrying cholesterol that can get trapped in the arterial wall. Measuring ApoB is the most accurate way of knowing how many suitcases of cholesterol are potentially dangerous and hazardous to my patient's health. Some of you may be familiar with doing uh, particle counts and particle size. Th those are good tests. Those have been around for a good while. Uh, but they have a lot of variability in their uh, reporting, in, in their results. And that's not a, a fault of the lab. It's a part of the, the testing platform. It's a qualitative test that gives more of an estimate of numbers, whereas ApoB is a quantitative test and, and is sensitive to day-to-day to -day variations in ApoB levels. The other thing about ApoB, and we'll tie this in uh, on another slide, but there's a type of cholesterol called lipoprotein little a that is also carried by ApoB. So all of the bad cholesterols are measured in this ApoB number. It is the single best cholesterol number to predict a patient's future risk for heart attack and stroke. And again, all of the quote dangerous cholesterol, all of the cholesterol that can get trapped in the arterial wall, as you can see on this picture, is carried by ApoB. Sadly, less than 5% of Americans have been tested for this. Europe has been doing this test for, for more than a decade, probably two decades, and is now their standard uh, test. In, in America, we're, we're slow to the uptake on this. So you're, you're going to be well ahead of your peers as you start measuring ApoB. I mentioned this cholesterol, lipoprotein little a. This is a genetically inherited trait. It's present in one out of three of Americans. So you're going to find this a lot. It's much more common in Caucasians than African-Americans. And, and this is at risk for, it causes increased risk for several reasons. One of which is that this lipoprotein A actually inhibits the ability of clots that form inside of the artery, inhibits their ability to start dissolving. Think about the clotting system. We, we have a system that's designed to protect us from bleeding to death. So it's designed to instantly clot when there's a hole. But if that clot is unregulated, it just keeps growing, then, then we turn a small clot into the entire arterial system is full of a clot. So this thing called fibrinolysis regulates that. It turns out lipoprotein little a inhibits that action and so if your patient has plaque rupture at the site of a coronary vessel where that plaque has become vulnerable and ruptured, the clot that forms over that plaque rupture is going to grow faster, it'll grow larger, and more likely to cause a, a full-fledged heart attack. The other thing about lipoprotein little a, for reasons that we don't fully understand yet, uh, it also increases the risk that their aortic valve, one of the main valves in the heart, becomes calcified with age, and that can cause a condition requiring valve replacement. So identifying folks with this genetic trait is critical for their health, and because it's a genetic trait, it helps you find cases within their family. So Mr. Smith comes in, has lipoprotein A, we need to tell Mr. Smith your brothers and sisters might have this and your children might have this. We need to look further. It is totally invisible on the standard lipid profile. It is carried by ApoB. And so some of the ApoB elevations that you'll find are going to be related to how much lipoprotein A is there. Management, and we'll touch on this in one of the case studies, but management, um, number one, means be more aggressive on identifying on managing all of the other risks that you've discovered in your patient. Blood pressure, blood sugar, um, smoking, lack of exercise, poor diet, et cetera. Be more aggressive on that when they have lipoprotein A. 
statin type drugs do not mitigate the risk of this uh, trait. And that's one reason statins don't prevent all heart attacks. Uh, in fact, we know that it's about a 30% reduction in heart attacks when you use a statin drug. So 70% of the time it doesn't. There are pharmacological- You hear that? 70% of the time it doesn't really work. Correct, correct. Mm -hmm. And that's why that's why we can't because rely- Because most people have this lipoprotein middle A. I'm sorry, say that again. I'm not sure what if you realize she was on mute or not, but let me just okay. mute that one. That's fine. And you okay. can ask that question at the end. That'd be fantastic. Yeah. Sorry, Dan. The other thing is the, the pharmacologic companies, pharmaceutical companies are anxious to develop a therapy for this. Uh, and there are some that you'll be reading about, but these are thousands of dollars uh, of expense. And the truth be told, nicotinic acid is an effective strategy for lipoprotein A and other things. And, and we'll talk more about that. So let's look at, at a brief case study with lipoprotein A. This is a 55-year-old gentleman that I saw, has none of the traditional risk factors for cardiovascular disease. He really was one of our star patients in terms of, of all the traditional risk factors. But he had a family history, both parents, dad in his 60s, mom a little bit older, and his dad had aortic valve disease. Again, these are clues to the fact that, that he might have something more going on. And this patient, uh, just a few years prior, so I started seeing him a few years after his heart attack, he, he nearly died from his coronary plaque rupture event. He had thrombosis of his uh, anterior descending artery, nearly died from that, and he had a normal lipid profile the day of his heart attack. He's one of those 50 percenters. Well, lo and behold, we checked his lipoprotein little a, and it was four times the upper limit. Of oh my goodness. Number one, that's why he was forming plaque faster than normal. Number two, that's why he had a big heart attack. Again, that clot grew bigger and faster and, and became more dangerous to him. Again, I mentioned earlier, statins don't reduce the risk associated with this trait. Remember, it's genetic, so he's had it since day one, so it's had a long time to have an impact on him. We talked about optimizing lifestyle factors, but absolutely, this gentleman was placed on nicotinic acid. And we'll come back to how I use nicotinic acid at the end of this talk. But that was a key uh, part of his treatment. He's now three years down the road. All of the other tests that we do are showing me that his plaque is actually healing and the nicotinic acid is a part of that. So let's talk more about nicotinic acid. Many of you may be already using this, but you might not be using it enough. You might not be using it for all of the benefits that are, are in nicotinic acid. First of all, and I've got references on all of these slides so that you can go back to the source documents, uh, but we know that in diabetics, their good cholesterol works better. Their endothelium is healthier. They make higher nitric oxide levels, which helps to keep that endothelium healthy. We know that diabetics have fewer non-fatal heart attacks when they're on niacin. Uh, and, and that's a study that was back you know, more, more than 15 years ago now. We know that for lipoprotein A, that it will lower it by up to 50%. And every 1% you can lower somebody's little lipoprotein little A reduces their risk of major adverse cardiovascular events by a little over 1.3%. It does matter. It does have a benefit. We can't totally normalize lipoprotein A. There's, there's no drug yet that does that, but we don't have to normalize it. We just have to help reduce it. There are lots of other nicotinic acid benefits. Fibrinogen levels are lower. Adiponectin levels are higher. Uh, a chemical called ADMA that actually inhibits nitric oxide synthesis. Welcome in to do. Enter your meeting ID followed by... It actually 
reduces the level of this chemical that inhibits nitric oxide production. It helps cholesterol get transported out of the arterial wall. It reduces inflammation. And bilirubin is one of our body's most potent antioxidants and nicotinic acid raises that level. So there are lots of great benefits to nicotinic acid. Here are a couple of studies uh, in the literature about what is the impact of nicotinic acid on plaque. The first study more than 20 years ago, they looked at folks that had low HDL. At the time that LDL was actually considered to be normal and their triglycerides were normal, at least back, back in 2001, that was considered to be a normal triglyceride level. They were placed on a statin either with or without niacin and they looked at what their arterial uh, diameter was, how, how open was the, was the artery. And lo and behold, the folks on niacin, along with the statin, they, they didn't have a niacin-only arm, so that they did combine it with a statin. Uh, it reduced the stenosis only in the, in the niacin. Yeah. Uh, no. And there was a 90% reduction in these major adverse cardiovascular events over just a three-year time period. Tremendous benefit. We've known that for 20 years. Another study a little over 15 years ago looked at even better cholesterol numbers in, in the baseline patients. Again, it was a statin with or without niacin uh, study, but it, this one also showed in just a little over a year, there, there was less stenosis in the, in the arteries. So niacin absolutely has great benefit in, in lots of patient groups. So let's move from lipids on to uh, glucose and, and A1C testing. I mentioned that 90% of the people that are insulin resistant don't know it. Well, guess what? Half of all Americans who, who are either diabetic already or pre-diabetic, many of those don't know it. In fact, about 25% of the folks that are diabetic don't even know they're diabetic. Well, guess what? It takes 30 years to become diabetic. They've been insulin resistance for decades. This is, and that insulin resistance has been trashing their arteries. And this is one reason diabetics do so poorly. 80% of the pre-diabetics don't know it. Oh my goodness. Why is this? Well, the main reason is high blood sugar has absolutely no symptoms. Yeah, until they are consistently above 180. I mean, they have to have florid diabetes to cause thirst and extra or increased urination and risk for infections and so forth. Some of the traditional things that doctors are trained uh, in diagnosing diabetes. This is a silent killer. All of these that we're talking about today are silent killers until suddenly the problem is evident. Let's remember that a fasting glucose is an instantaneous picture. It's like taking the old Polaroid. You know, I, I can snap a picture and see what, see what you look like in about a minute. Um, and it's normal for two decades before somebody's di diagnosed with diabetes. And yet they're insulin resistant during that time. The A1C that everybody hangs their hat on, it has its use. It's a 60 day average glucose reading but it doesn't rise until at least a decade before the diagnosis of diabetes. So these are some reasons why that HDL triglyceride ratio is important. This is when we can find folks that have the normal fasting glucose, the normal A1C, look at their triglyceride HDL ratio and diagnose their insulin resistance. In terms of cut points for glucose and A1C, you can read these on the screen. Um, but let me emphasize that it takes 20 years or more for that pre-diabetic to suddenly show a blood sugar above 100. So when you get glucose and A1C readings, if they're below these cut points, don't automatically rule out the fact that they may have an insulin system problem underlying that. A truly optimal fasting glucose is below 90, and a truly optimal A1C is below 5%. Let's move on to inflammation. 
Most of you probably already know this, but I'm going to say it out loud anyway. We now know that chronic inflammation is responsible for the majority of these diseases of aging. It's because there's a root cause that's been driving that inflammatory response. And the inflammation, rather than protecting us, which is what inflammation was designed to do, inflammation was designed to attack an invader, attack a virus or a bacteria or a splinter that's that's in our body and get rid of it. But when you have root causes that are driving inflammation, that inflammation is damaging cells and damaging arteries. That inflammation is supposed to be a healing response, but if you don't stop the root cause of the damage, the inflammation becomes chronic and the damage accelerates. That acceleration of damage then leads to more inflammation and, and there you go. HSCRP is on the CIT panel. It's, it's a very important marker because if it's normal, if it's below 0 0.5, it's highly unlikely that they have uncontrolled inflammation in their system. But it is nonspecific. So it can be elevated from an infection. It can be in, uh, elevated because of an ankle sprain. Uh, and a whole variety of other chronic diseases can elevate the C-reactive protein. But the main cause in the majority of folks is this excessive fat storage in and around organs, the visceral fat that I alluded to earlier. And we know that insulin resistance, I'm going to keep hammering on this insulin resistance because it's so prevalent, number one, and so devastating, number two. But we know this is why the prediabetics and diabetics gain weight. It's from the insulin causing fat storage. That visceral fat produces the HSCR re HSCRP response in the body. So we can monitor that. You heard me say that truly optimal is below 0.5. For purposes of our CIT test, we're, we're letting you know that below one is in the normal range. If you're above 10, let me jump to the bottom of the slide. If you're above 10 on the C-reactive protein, there's probably something much more serious going on. Those folks deserve a deeper dive into thing, anywhere from cancer to autoimmune diseases um, to, to hidden infections that have been smoldering. So a really high C-reactive protein, let's take a really deep dive into what's going on. Between three and 10, all bets are off. It could be as simple as a sprained ankle or a sore throat or a head cold last week, a variety of other conditions. So you do need to ask patients uh, about any symptoms they've had in the few weeks prior to getting this test drawn. The majority of the time when it's elevated, though, it's going to be between one and three. They're not going to have had a recent infection. They're not going to have had an injury. They're, they're not ill. They feel fine, but they have chronic inflammation. And this group, this between one and three, those are the ones that are really at high risk for likely already having arterial disease. We know that there a trial several years ago that simply looked at using a one specific statin, rosuvastatin, in patients with known arterial disease and decided if their C-reactive protein was above two or below two, did they get put on a statin drug? And it turns out that if it was above two and you put them on a statin drug, they had fewer heart attacks than if you didn't. So we, we know that this is a valid marker for risk. Right, now, your treatment strategies are don't have to be constrained to statins. I'm, I'm not saying that. I am just showing you a trial that shows that C-reactive protein absolutely is associated with prediction of a heart attack and stroke risk. Last test that we'll look at together is a metabolic test for homocysteine. Uh, this is a normal breakdown product uh, from protein intake. So we make homocysteine, but elevated levels we now know are associated both with heart disease and dementia risk. And we know that there are folks that have different uh, problems with methylation. Uh, they have the MTHFR, um, abnormalities and they can't process the amino acids properly and homocysteine levels build up. 
It turns out that dementia risk starts at 11. 11 or higher, uh, they're at a higher lifetime risk for dementia. Number two, if it's above 30, we know that they're at a much higher risk for heart attack, stroke, atherosclerosis. And again, this is another silent killer. There are absolutely no symptoms for these conditions until they already have their memory problem or they're, they're having their heart attack. I mentioned the methylation pathways, and it turns out that vitamins B6, 9, and 12, those three specifically, among other things, detoxify and metabolize homocysteine. And so that's one of the treatment strategies. If you don't test, then you don't know what to do. You can't guess on homocysteine. So testing mm -hmm. is critical. So before we close uh, with some Q&A, I, I want to take a little bit deeper dive into a case study. This, this is a 66-year-old patient of mine who had coronary artery calcifications. He knew he had plaque, and he also knew he had calcifications in his aortic valve based upon a CT scan of his chest that he had, had done elsewhere. And his wife was concerned because he was repeating questions, having troubles with short-term recall, remembering what he was going to do that day, and so on. So here you can see his, his initial testing. Um, he's one of the ones that does have a cholesterol problem, even on the uh, standard lipid profile. And in fact, you can see his cholesterol HDL ratio suggests that he's actively forming new plaque as we speak. So he's got a, a cholesterol problem. His ApoB, optimal on that, I didn't mention this earlier, optimal ApoB is below 70. His is twice that. And oh, by the way, his lipoprotein little a, that genetic trait, is eight times normal. Oh my goodness. That's why he's got an aortic valve calcification. That's one of the reasons he's got arterial disease. The ApoB, part of that ApoB is carrying his lipoprotein little a. And look what look at his homocysteine level. That's at least a piece of his dementia issue. Surprisingly, his HSCRP was normal. Let me just make this statement. A, a high CRP, we talked about some of the, quote, false positives for that. A normal HSCRP just means that right now he doesn't have significant active chronic inflammation but he's got plenty of things that are going to drive him towards that inflammation. So we still want to monitor that. So what did I do beyond lifestyle therapy? And, and I always make this statement both to patients and colleagues when I give talks. I can't out-prescribe somebody's lifestyle, period, end of sentence. If they're not eating right, if they're not moving right, if they're not sleeping right, if they're taking in toxins, if they're not handling stress properly, they're not taking care of their oral health, they're not taking care of their gut health, they're going to have issues and we can't out-prescribe those things. So, But what can we do beyond lifestyle? Well, we know that a low dose of aspirin in people with known arterial disease, it helps to decrease how fast a clot grows and how big it gets. So while we're stabilizing somebody's plaque, a small dose of aspirin helps to give them some protection against plaque rupture causing problems. The form of niacin that I like is endurocin. It's got good um, absorption, good bioavailability. Um, it's well tolerated. It's not very expensive. The way I use it is I'll start at a 500 milligram dose, give it with their last meal of the day, and over every couple of weeks, I'll increase it by another 500 milligrams. For most of my patients, my target dose is two grams a day, so 2,000 milligrams per day. In this patient, it was chosen because we wanted to lower his lipoprotein A. His triglycerides that were high at 129, we want to lower that, that because that's a direct cause of inflammation. And it will help lower his ApoB. Endurison has lots of great benefits, the nicotinic acid. Number three, I put him on vitamin K2 as MK7 to help stabilize his plaque. And the other thing that we know is that uh, this specific form of vitamin K2 helps to 
helps plaque to heal with less calcification happening. This gentleman's already got calcified uh, vessels and aortic valves. We, we want to try to inhibit that, uh, reduce the amount of calcification while he's healing, if at all possible. I put him on a B6, B9, B12 combination called fulvic to lower his homocysteine levels. And then used red yeast rice because we know that it has many of the exact same benefits at lowering ApoB and stabilizing plaque that have been seen in some of the statin trials. So that was his initial treatment. And I wanna show you next before we open it up for Q&A, what happened to his lipid values, his lipoprotein A, 26% reduction in that is great. His homocysteine is now normal. And you know what I mentioned about his C-reactive protein was normal? Well, guess what? He was okay. having some inflammation. It, we lowered his HSCRP by helping to address some of the root causes of chronic inflammation. I see that. So here, here's uh, just one case study. I, I could have pulled a, a dozen, but I thought you'd all be interested in seeing some pretty dramatic results um, with both lifestyle and the right combination of supplements. So what are our takeaways? Test, don't guess. Don't, don't think your patients are okay. Optimize lifestyle. I don't care what their test results show. Even if they're all normal, we still wanna optimize lifestyle. And then we wanna use the right supplements in the right dose for the right reasons. So with that, I will uh, pause, let James uh, or Casey moderate the Q&A and, and let's have fun for the next 15 minutes or so. David, that was fantastic. A really helpful kind of one to three. And we, we've had some, some good questions in there. Casey had a direct one, but um, one of the ones that we had here was, um, how long should you continue the, the nicotinic acid once serum levels or lipids are optimized? In, in my practice, I, I leave it on. I, I don't take it off because it's, number one, they had a driver for those abnormal values in the first place. Number two, think back to the slide that showed all of the other benefits of nicotinic acid, promoting nitric oxide in the system, lowering fibrinogen levels, decreasing the inflammatory response. Uh, so it's it's a long-term uh, agent in, in my practice. Okay, that's great. Um, another one here, uh, that, that question was from Svetlana, so thank you very much. Will you, and then the, a follow-on from Svetlana was, will you reduce doses for long-term? On yeah, so, yeah, so th that's a good question. I, I think that's a fair question. So in the in the lipoprotein A folks, no, that you, you've got to keep them on that dose because they'll just go right back into producing the high levels of LP little a. Uh, so in, in my nicot in my LP little a patients, I find the dose that lowers them optimally, and that's forever and ever on men. The other folks, you can you can play with the dose and 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 maybe find the lowest dose that controls all of the factors that you're looking at. But again, it's a well tolerated drug. Um, it it has all of the other benefits that we talked about. So it, it, it's rare that I back off on the dose of it. Another one here is um, if if the goal is to get my patient off statins, um, what? Alternative options do you recommend to treat the high sense of CRP or the ApoB, given it's the suitcase that you were describing earlier with the cholesterol? Yeah, so I think you can all tell from from my focus on nicotinic acid. That's that's my workhorse. That that is the workhorse for lots of things, but especially for the lipid issues. Um, I mean, every single lipid value improves with nicotinic acid. Total cholesterol goes down, LDL goes down, VLDO goes down, triglycerides go down, ApoB goes down, HDL goes up. It's, it's a great uh, solution for those folks. Some other things, and again, today's talk wasn't meant to cover the entire spectrum of things, but so let, let me talk about a few other things for my lipid folks. Uh, plant sterols inhibit the absorption of cholesterol in the gut. So a product such as Cholestoff, and there are many others that are on the market, but the plant sterols help to inhibit that absorption of cholesterol from the gut. 
uh, and will lower ApoB and total cholesterol levels. Let me also make this statement that most of the cholesterol that people absorb in their gut is from the bile that their liver is secreting in response to a meal. Bile salts are very cholesterol rich. So the liver is making cholesterol for lots of reasons, one of which is to make bile. The bile gets released when you eat a meal, but that bile is carrying cholesterol into the gut. Downstream in the small intestine, there's a system to reabsorb that cholesterol and recycle it. Well, that's great if your cholesterol levels are normal, but if you have a high cholesterol, we want to inhibit that absorption of cholesterol downstream. So the, uh, the cholesterol type products are great for that. Fiber is an awesome cholesterol lowering solution. The psyllium fibers, the soluble fibers in diet are, are excellent choices for controlling lipids. And then the last one, uh, so that we can get some other questions, and the last uh, thing that I'll pull out are the omega-3 fish oils. Uh, or if you're a vegetarian, get, get the vegetarian sorts of omega-3s. But they help to lower triglyceride levels. So we have lots of things other than statin drugs. That's great. And then uh, one here from Jeannie. Um, can you take red yeast rice with statin as well? With, with a statin as well, sorry. No yeah. Oh, that's a great question. So because the red yeast rice has a statin-like uh, chemical in it that helps to lower the cholesterol, uh, we don't want to mix red yeast rice with a statin. They're, they're going to get a double dose, in essence, of, of statin. And, and we all know that there are some potential side effects with that. The nice thing about red yeast rice is that it, it's got a low enough dose that it's very well tolerated. Uh, so so I, I would not combine them. And then Kenton Crowley, um, do you use Arteracil HP? I've, I've had a lot of folks ask me that. I've, I've not used it because there really isn't good science that I've seen uh, showing that it improves outcomes. Um, in fact, again, I don't want to throw stones at, at any company or any person. Uh, but it's important to look at the literature and what's published. And I, I look for outcomes. Uh, and, and I haven't seen that yet. If, if anybody has them, I'm happy to look at it and read through it. Uh, the other thing is, I really haven't found that I've needed to add it. it that's a fairly new product. Uh, I've been doing this for almost 20 years, and I get good outcomes, and so I really haven't seen a need to add that. That's great. Um, uh, Dr. Bethany Brenner here. Is there a difference in treatment outcomes when the age is 50 or 70, and does gender play a role? Ooh, I, I love that question. Uh, so a, a couple of thoughts on that. Uh, number one, the older you are, the more damage your body's incurred throughout the arterial system. Let's just pick that for one thing. So the, the, the cardiovascular system at age 70 has endured 20 more years of damage. And so you have much higher risk and are less responsive to efforts to stop damage. It's like it's like the house is already almost burned down before you call the fire department. That doesn't mean that we don't treat those folks. It's just let's let's be realistic on, on what the outcome is going to have. One of the important things on gender is that women get overlooked in, in the traditional risk factor stratification. Uh, and because women on average are a decade older when they start having their cardiovascular events, again, they tend to get ignored in, in most studies and in many practices. Uh, the truth is women have as many cardiovascular events as men. They're just a decade older uh, for the most part, but they're gonna have it earlier if they had premature menopause. They're gonna have it earlier if they had preeclampsia during a pregnancy. They're gonna have it earlier if they had gestational diabetes. They're going to have it earlier if they had multiple miscarriages. So I, I tend to be um, agnostic when it comes to gender in terms of how aggressively I look for and, and treat folks. Here's a good one. Uh, I know it's a question on many people's lips. Uh, which is better, ApoB or particle number or particle size? I know you addressed that, but uh, that's one that uh, comes up pretty regularly. Yeah, no, that, that's a great question. So ApoB is a quantitative 
test. It gives you a precise amount of ApoB, number of suitcases that are in your in the person's bloodstream. Particle number and particle size have been validated. There, there's good studies that show that those are valid things to, to measure. Here, the problem is that, again, there it's a qualitative test, meaning there it's a calculation of of a range of particle numbers and particle sizes. And if you do that seven days in a row, you're gonna get significant changes in, in the number. And it's not because the test is bad per se, it's just not as accurate as the ApoB. And then lastly, ApoB has the most published data for number one, being a risk predictor and something to monitor that is stable from day to day um, in terms of monitoring. So APOB wins. Yeah. Thanks, Terry. That was a great question. Um, Jeannie, um, is the enduracin over the counter? It is, uh, which is a two-edged sword. I mean, it, it makes it less expensive that way, but uh, there are folks that are, are going to be using nicotinic acid without supervision. Uh, we didn't talk about some of the things you do need to watch for on nicotinic acid. So let me in the few minutes just hit those real quick. Number one, it can uh, cause peptic ulcer disease. It can aggravate gastritis. So you have to be careful in those folks. Number two, it can raise uric acid levels and trigger gout. So you don't want to start uh, nicotinic acid if somebody's gout prone, and especially if they've had a recent gout attack, get their uric acid under control first. Number three, I mentioned a lot of good things it does, but it does raise homocysteine levels. So when you're using nicotinic acid, if you're adding it to somebody who's already had their homocysteine level measured and it was normal, you want to remeasure it after they're on their dose and make sure you don't need to, to treat that homocysteine elevation. Um, so, so there are some some downsides to it being over the counter, but it is over the counter. And I have my patients order it through Amazon. Okay. Um, will you recommend to add uh, nitric oxide supplements to the treatment? Uh, so I'm gonna give you just my approach. Uh, again, I haven't, so the nitric oxide supplements are a newer, um, newer to the, to the scene, meaning in the last decade or so. I haven't seen the need to use that as a routine thing. I, I don't think it's wrong to use it. I'm not saying that. I haven't had to use that. Great. Uh, I think that is, uh, um, please repeat where you order nicotinic acid from. Uh, Amazon. So just go to amazon.com and get the Enduracin. Now, there are other companies that do that, so... Again, you, you may have a supplement provider that can also do that for you. Okay, perfect, perfect. So Dr. David, that was great. A, thank everyone for those great questions. Um, that was really, uh, really great um, kind of back and forth there. And uh, thanks, David, for being uh, so sharp on his feet on all of those things. So that was fantastic. Um, so again, um, if there's anything else, um, uh, one more question. Oh, thanks for everyone, so that was great. Um, David, thank you so much indeed. Uh, as I say, this will be recorded. Uh, and we'll also make available a slide. So uh, we'll email that out to everyone who's uh, participated, anyone who signed up as well. And then at some point, we'll also uh, add that to our website. So Dr. David, thank you so much for uh, such an informative talk. Um, really great. And thank everyone for their great questions as well. Um, so again, without any further ado, uh, thank you for the first uh, talk that we've done. We've got another one coming up in another couple of weeks time with Dr. Jennifer Stagg talking about how she uses the testing as well. So uh, we look forward to that and thank you all. Uh, without further ado, we'll, uh, we'll sign off. So thank you again, Dr. David. You're welcome. Bye-bye.